Well, it all started with Holger Crawford, industrialist, visionary, donator. And he was a self-made man in the sense that um, he was brought up in moderate, moderate circumstances with a single mother who managed to get him through school and Handelshögskola, where he was a top student. And there he was recruited by Ruben Rousing, who took him here to Lund. When they started Tetra Pak, which had introduced revolutionary packaging we all use, already in 1951. But he was also visionary, and in 1964 he founded Gambro, which developed artificial kidneys which saved many, many lives. As you know, we have two kidneys, and that's good luck because you really need them. At that time, there were no transplant possible to make any transplants, and you had to have dialysis. Here you can see Holger Crawford with the first artificial kidney, and here is the inventor, Alval, and as you can see, it's not supposed to be inside the person. And here is a more modern version for Brigambro. He was also a donor. He donated large parts of his wealth to promote science and education. You could say it's payback to science for the commercial success he had based on science. The Crawford Foundation was founded in 1980 it supports scientific training and research, but also the upbringing and education of young people, including support for sporting and cultural uh, and artistic activities. Here you can see one of the donations to the hospital here in Lund. I wouldn't go close to that either. It's actually it's a robot surgeon. And I suppose this would be a person on the other end of the line uh, operating it. And in Lund you can also see more traces of, of uh, donations, mostly important maybe Holger Crawford's Center of Economics, the Seoul Center, uh, and Lucas Medicus, which actually was Holger's family home, which he donated to Medicinska Foreningen. But he also founded Anna Greta and Holger Crawford Fund, which forms the basis for the Crawford Prizes, which the first prize was awarded in 1982. It is given out in the fields which are not covered by the Nobel Prize, that is mathematics, astronomy, geoscientists, geosciences and biosciences, and also arthritis, polyarthritis, which was, uh, which was uh, something that afflicted Holger. It is almost on par with the Nobel Prize. It's, the laureates are selected by the, uh, the Academy, and it's handed out by the king with a prize sum of six million. Here you can see the last latest Crawford Prize winner in mathematics, Jakob Eliasbe in 2016. Now the Crawford Academy lecture were initiated in 2014. Here is, sorry, one of the first laureates, Sir Martin Rees, astronomer. And um, the purpose of the lectures is to promote understanding of, to young people of the research fields covered by the Crawford Prize. This year is in mathematics. And the, lore, uh, the lecture today is Tadashik Tokieda from Stanford uh, University. He has an interesting CV. He started with painting in Japan, then classic studies in classical languages in France, and finally mathematics with a PhD 
from Princeton. He's also active in outreach in the developing world, in particular Africa. He's also an amateur magician, and he will show you the world from a piece of paper, which sounds magical to me. I give you Tadashi Tokeda. Tadashi, the floor and table is yours. Let the show begin. As we go through life, we encounter numbers that are significant. For example, do you recognize this number, 3.14.15 and so on? What is this? Yes, that's right. It would have been pi if that digit had been 7 instead of 4. And then, what about this, 299 and so on? Um, people who have done physics will recognize this quite quickly. Yes, that's right. That's the speed of light in vacuum in meters per second. And then, once in a while, you also encounter numbers that look significant, but which you cannot place. For example, when we saw, I saw this number for the first time, I knew that it was a significant number in my life, and then I didn't, but I couldn't quite recognize it. So what is it? I mobilized my scientific education and the culture, tried to figure it out, but I still can't see it. And finally, Eureka, yes, of course, that's the telephone number of the Crawford Foundation. <laughs> now, the light motif of this talk is this number, 2.5, and I'd like to convince you that it is the number exactly between 2 and 3. And it turns out it is naturally the dimension in which paper or sheet membrane of any kind lives and continues to surprise us because a sheet of paper by itself intrinsically is a two-dimensional object, but it will be of quite significance that it lives inside an ambient three-dimensional space. That's the extrinsic property. And this interplay between intrinsic on the one hand and extrinsic on the other hand will be the light motif for this talk. Um, let's do the top camera. So I'll begin with a little magic trick. Here is a coaster that you put under a cup to drink, and I brought a piece of paper with a hole in it. And I fold this paper, and you'll see that I can pass this coaster, circular coaster, through this hole. It is really going through. I haven't started cheating yet. It will come soon. And uh, I can pass it backward as well, but if you put the coaster next to the hole, it is clear that the diameter of the disk is greater than the diagonal of the hole. I didn't tear the paper, I didn't stretch it. How can it go through? Huh? And yet, if I fold it like that, it is really going through the hole, is it not? Yeah. And it's really passing through, through the hole. But what's passing is larger than what's being passed through. Now, because you very kindly came today and you are very nice people, I'd like to give away the secret for free. And you see, when you first fold the paper, like so, the largest gap that you can take advantage of to pass the disk is this gap, which used to be the diagonal of this hole across. But that's not the only thing we do. Having put it this way, I now start twisting the paper like so. And as you, it does, as it twists, you see that paper starts rising towards the camera, vertically up. So it's escaping from the two-dimensional world of the table into 3D. And I keep twisting until those two sides become aligned. And then I squash and crease. And at the end, I have to shift it by one. In that configuration, the gap that I have created is this one, which, if you think about it, used to be not the diagonal, but the sum of the, those two sides. And if you remember Pythagoras, you have gained an extra factor of square root of 2, which is a little more than 40%. So the secret of the game is to make a hole so that it is, its diagonal is shorter than the diameter, but the sum of two sides is slightly longer. And then you can pass this um, through and through. It's all in the wrist. OK. Um, good. And this shows that. By staying in 2D, you might be stuck, but you can go out in the 3D and come back down, and that gives you an extra degree of freedom and lots of universe to explore. Do you recognize this portrait? He's one of the most romantic figures in mathematical history. 
Do you happen to know this? Uh, he died very young. That's Evariste Galois, a Frenchman. He died at the age of uh, 20. And you might be thinking, ah, oh, but that actually can't do arithmetic, because if you subtract 11 from 32, it's 21, not 20. But he died just before the 21st birthday in a duel. So he left a gigantic legacy for all of mathematics, and we're still chewing on it. And you um, find out what he did at the university level. And one of the problems which he taught us to think about correctly is this classical problem that goes back to the ancient Greeks. You might have had the experience of using a ruler like this and a compass in order to draw various figures. And if you have a, an angle, it's pretty easy to use a ruler and compass only to divide that angle into two equal parts, draw a line from the corner which divides that angle into two equal parts, in other words, the bisection of an angle. The same question was asked about trisection, that is, given an arbitrary angle, is there an algorithm with rule and compass always, only, to divide that angle into three equal parts? To be sure, there are, of course, angles that can be divided into three equal parts. For example, a flat angle, 120, 180 degrees, that's easy. But that's not the question. The question is, given an arbitrary angle, can you do it? And Galois taught us that, in fact, it's not in general possible. However clever you are, and whatever you, you try, for example, an angle as innocent looking as 60 degrees is not trisectable. In other words, 20 degree angle cannot be constructed ever. Um, it's a mathematical fact by rule and compass alone. However, there is an ancient Japanese art of origami. You might have heard of this. Ori means in Japanese folding, and kami means paper, so paper folding literally. And with origami, you can actually trisect any angle. Once you believe in the possibility, it's actually not too difficult to understand. On the left, I've drawn a paper model of how to bisect an angle. Let's first discuss how you divide an angle into two equal parts by folding a sheet of paper. For that purpose, imagine that you have given an angle as a corner of a sheet of paper. Usually, a corner of a sheet of paper is, of course, 90 degrees, but imagine that your given angle is in the corner. Then how do you bisect an angle? Well, it's very easy and natural, isn't it? You fold it in, in half. And then you arrange that those edges are aligned. And when they're aligned, you crease this part. And when you open, you have this line coming out of the corner, which is the bisector of the angle. Of course, that's easy to do. Well, trisection is not any harder, actually. So suppose that you are given an angle as a corner of a sheet of paper. And what you do is to fold the paper, but you overshoot and then come back. And so that you create this kind of pleat, which has three sheets. And then you negotiate those edges, and you negotiate them until they're aligned. And as they're aligned, you crease them. And when you open up, you have those two beautiful lines coming out of the corner. And these are the trisectors of that angle. And for n, if you want to divide an angle into n equal parts, it's equally easy. You go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then you create this pleat of, you know, of n sheets. And then you just open up. And that's how you do. Do you recognize this figure? He's equally, some people in the audience do. And he's uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, another giant in the mathematical history. And he looks really stern, but he was a stern character, rather formidable. And one of the, he also left a huge legacy for us. And one of the things that he taught us to think about correctly is the following problem. And this goes um, above the Greeks in some sense, beyond the Greeks. Uh, you remember, perhaps, also that with ruler and compass always, you can draw various geometric figures called regular polygons. For example, an equilateral triangle is one. That's a regular three-gon, if you like. And square is a regular four-gon. And a pentagon, like this, is a regular five-gon, and so on and so on. And which of those regular n-gons can you construct, can you draw with rule and compass? That's the question. Here, I've shown you a construction of regular three-gon. That is an equilateral triangle. That's quite easy. And Gauss showed what's written here, unfortunately, um, I know that we're filming, is not quite correct. But if n is an prime number, it has to be of a very special type called the Fermat prime. So it's 2 to 2 to some small n plus 1. And I threw in a power of 2 in front, because you know, once you have constructed, let's say, a regular, I don't know, 17 gone, it's easy to make it 34, double the number, because each angle can be divided into 2. 
no problem, right? So it's, uh, you can always double for free. That's why power of two is no problem. Um, in general, you can combine these things and then do something else. But anyway, if n is a prime, it has to be of this form. And if you plug in various parameter values of n, you see this strange sequence, 3, 5, 11, 257, 17, sorry, not 11, 17, is the one that Gauss discovered when he was a young man. So those are the only n's that you can construct for a regular n bomb. But you are beginning to suspect that with origami you can do all n. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to um, show you how that goes about. Um, that is done. Okay, so let's take a sheet of paper and I'll cut out a straight strip. Okay. Here it is. And what you do, I'll start with n equal 5. And 5 is on the list, so it's not that impressive, but this will expand the idea in the clearest possible way. So you take a strip of paper, and then you tie the simplest knot imaginable, like so. Hmm? Having tied a knot, you tighten it and then flatten it at the same time. You just have to keep negotiating, as always with origami. And you tighten and flatten it, tighten and flatten it, tighten and flatten it, and tighten and flatten it. And eventually, when you're done, you have a fairly tight, a tight and flat knot like this. And in order to show you what's going on, I'm going to tuck away what's the part that's sticking out. And after you do that, what you have is a beautiful regular pentagon. The beauty of this trick is that I didn't have to think at all. Nature just took care of everything. Yeah. It's a construction, but what's, who's constructing? Nature is constructing. I'm not constructing. So this works. And if you go to visit Japan and stay at a traditional inn called Ryokan, um, they'll lend you a nice pyjama, very soft, and you can just and take a stroll in town with that. It's called uh, yukata. And also, they lend you a belt, soft belt to go with it. And it's a traditional sort of courtesy to fold that belt in a pentagonal pattern like this and offer it to the guests. So this is a construction that was well known in Japan. Now, that's n equal 5, but you can generalize. You notice that when we made this trick of making a pentagon, I made the simplest possible knot. That is, I went through the knot once. Now, suppose that you go through the knot twice. You have to do it in a special fashion, but anyway, twice. And then you flatten and tighten. Then what emerges from a knot with two passes turns out to be a regular seven gone. And if you make three passes, regular nine gone, four passes, regular 11 gone, and so on and so on. So, oops. Here, you see the picture of n equal 5, and 7 looks like this. There's a slight sort of glitch in the picture, and, and so on and so on. So you can actually do any regular odd, ah, but somebody is going to complain. Well, if we did just one pass, it's already up to 5, and two passes is 7. But you know, what about n equals 3? What about the simplest case of the equilateral triangle, regular 3 gone? Can you do that with the same construction? Well, if one pass gives you 5 and 2 gives you 7, 3 gives you 9 and so on, how many passes should you make in the knot in order to go to n equals 3, you think? Huh? You should make a zero pass knot, that's right. And this is what happens. So you go in and you try to make a knot, but you don't quite manage and come out. And that's, uh, in that corner behind there is a regular three cone that's in a clear triangle. So it works as well. So as I explained, once you have access to all the any, uh, odd ends, you can always bisect. Doubling the number size is very cheap, so you can access all ends. Right. So far, we have been discussing pure mathematics, in particular geometry, but now we'll make a transition toward physics, and then later, gradually from physics and to engineering and physiology, we'll be expanding the area of uh, investigation and also of imagination. And we have to expand ourselves because the phenomena we are talking about 
They come under different names, depending on whether they have been deliberately designed or they have been randomly generated, exist across all scales in nature. Those that are deliberately designed might be called origami, and those that are randomly generated might be crumpling. And in between, there is the phenomenon, the key phenomenon of buckling. Buckling, by the way, you have that word in Swedish, I'm sure, um, is the following phenomenon. If you take, say, a rod and then compress it, press it from both ends, if the pressure is not too high, Actually, the road is becoming slightly shorter. It's barely noticeable, of course. But above a certain critical load, if you put too much pressure, at some point it goes, oop, you can't take it anymore, and it undergoes a large deflection. And that phenomenon is called buckling, thoroughly studied by Euler, and we'll come back to that. So all of these things exist in nature on all scales. For example, in the top left corner, I show you a picture of a certain sheet of paper, and that's called Mino Ori from Japan. And what it is, is that you take a sheet of paper and moisten it, and then wrinkle it. And after that, you take a fruit called persimmon, and you just rub persimmon against the paper and just stretch it. And then, after you stretch it, you dry, and then you moisten it and crumple it, and then you stretch it again, and you keep repeating this process. And what it does, apparently, is to enmesh the little fibers of the paper so, in such a complicated way that it strengthens the paper. So strong, indeed, that from this kind of paper, treated paper, you can make clothes, and also shoes, and bags, and so on. So those uh, wrinkles are taking place on an order of less than a millimeter, very, very small micro wrinkles, if you like. Here you have a picture of a very friendly animal, and you can see that his trunks are lined with wrinkles. They are the best of biomechanical and the thermal reasons why those wrinkles are present. And indeed, biological nature is very adept at taking advantage of wrinkles and crumpling and all that kind of thing, this kind of phenomenon, in order to regulate its, its life, literally. And then that's you know, happening on the scale of centimeters to, millim uh, to meters on the biological scale. That's our scale, daily scale. And then there is um, crumpling or origami on a huge scale as well. Here's a map of South America, and the backbone of South America is, of course, the Andes mountain range. What is Andes? Well, it is a wrinkled sheet of paper. You see, here you have the South American plate, and here is the Pacific plate. To be precise, this part is called Nazca plate, and the Nazca plate is pushing against the South American plate. And what happens when you push a sheet like that? is, of course, you start rising, you have deflection, and that crease that you start creating is none other than the Andes Mountains. I cannot help introducing a little digression here. You know that the Amazon is the greatest river in terms of volume flux in the world. You know, it collects water from practically all of South America and gushes that down to the Atlantic Ocean. So it's flowing from this side to this side. You know that it used to flow into the Pacific in the other direction? But it used to flow in the Pacific, but the Andes started rising, 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 and at some point it tipped the balance in the other direction, and the Amazon started going in that direction. It's, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, this is happening on the order of kilometers, in fact, hundreds and thousands of kilometers, and that's also an origami. And the challenge is, can you, in this huge and incredible diversity of phenomena, discover some science and extract some mathematical laws? In particular, even in the case you wrinkle, you crumple a random sheet of paper. Here you have a photograph of a wrinkled and crumpled sheet of paper. It looks like a crumpled sheet of paper for the good reason that it is actually a crumpled sheet of paper. But what I'm asking is, what is it that we are seeing? Let me reformulate this confusing question. Suppose that you ask an artist to draw a crumpled sheet of paper. You see that the artist will have a really hard time. There are very few people who can draw a crumpled sheet of paper in a convincing fashion. You know, a picture that they produce doesn't look like a crumpled sheet of paper, although as soon as we see a crumpled sheet of paper, real crumpled sheet of paper, we can recognize it as such because we have li lived in this universe for long enough. So, a crumpled sheet of paper is, in some sense, just a network that you draw on your paper. Here's what we do. Ah, is it? Uh, good, it's focused. And in order to fix our idea, let's agree not only to crumple a sheet of paper, but to squash it onto the table into 2D. And then we open. 
here is the result. What is it that we're seeing? You see, it's a network, as I said. In other words, there are points connected by lines or vertices and edges. But not every network drawn on a sheet of paper is a result of crumpling. Yeah? So what conditions must be satisfied, what properties must be possessed by a network of points and lines in order for that to be manufacturable as a result of crumpling a sheet of paper? That is the first question. And in fact, it is a very, very interesting challenge for us to figure out. I show here a little lion. And when you, it's an origami lion, when you open it, this is the folding pattern. And please don't pay too much attention to blue and red. Those are the so-called region valley folds. But the point is, if you look carefully at this kind of thing, for example, this point has four lines coming into it, right? So three blue, blue lines and one dotted red line. And that's also four, that's also four. Some other points have um, six lines meeting there. And some other points have as many as eight lines meeting there, and so on. And you notice that all these numbers are even. And it turns out, it's a theorem, that when you crumple a sheet of paper and squash it and open it, the resulting pattern, however you do it, always has this property that every vertex or every point has an even number of edges coming into it. You can never have an odd number. That's a theorem and fairly easy to prove, but slightly tedious. So let's accept this. Um, for the experts in the audience, what we are saying essentially is that when you squash, I create what you might call a singular covering. And so there's a front, back, front, back, front, back pattern when you squash, and that forces the parity. But anyway, so the simplest case that you see is a case like this. So let's do an actual demo. And I hope that this is not going to break anything. Um, the simplest fold that everyone uses in daily life is what the origamist calls sometimes the square fold. So it's that kind of fold. And you see that there are 90 degree angles here, over there. OK, and I should probably draw the lines so that you can see them better. Um, so that's, those are the lines, and that's, that's 90 degrees. OK, but if you, that's doing carefully. If you do a random job, you have something like that. And here, you have those four lines coming into a point. That's a valley, and the other three are ridges. And that's a random four lines meeting at that point. OK. Now, it turns out that when you do this by origami, by folding a paper, those angles that you have created of those four sectors cannot be arbitrary. The first condition is that those, let's call those angles alpha, beta, gamma, delta, they must add up to 360 degrees. Well, you wish that you said it, but I said it first, okay. That's an easy part. But the second condition is really remarkable. It says that the opposing pairs of angles, that is alpha plus gamma and beta plus delta, must have the same sum. So here, we are talking about, let's say, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So alpha plus gamma should equal beta plus delta. By the way, in this simple example of 90 degree everywhere, that's certainly true, because this plus this equals this plus this. But that's true in general when you have four lines meeting at the point. Now, I'd like to prove this to you. I'd like to give you a proof to take home. In order to do this, let's go back to how this was made in the first place. This is angle alpha. So if you look at it from the other side, it's alpha, but alpha equals beta plus delta, oops, minus gamma. Did you understand that? No, I didn't understand it. So let's do it again. So that's alpha, yes? And so if you turn over, that angle is also alpha. It's the same thing. But looking carefully, this angle alpha consists of overlapping beta and delta, but the overlap, which we have to subtract, because I overcounted, is gamma. So alpha equals beta plus delta minus gamma, which is exactly what we want. OK, QED. <laughs> and in general, you can take that home, can't you? OK, and it doesn't weigh a lot. Um, in general, suppose that you have an even number of sectors coming in, let's say alpha 1 through alpha 2n, or something like that. and the necessary and sufficient condition, this completely solves the local problem of um, um, how, what's 
kind of configuration is going to be manufactured by folding a sheet of paper, is that those angles must add up to 360 degrees, and also what the mathematicians call the alternating sum. That is, alpha 1 minus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 minus alpha 4 plus minus plus minus must close to zero. This kind of so-called closure condition appears in an algebraic topology context in mathematics called homology. Anyway, this is a discrete manifestation of something called homology. Anyway, this must close to zero. And the simplest case that we discussed can be written like that. Instead of writing it this way, you can write alpha minus beta plus gamma minus delta equals zero, right? Okay. And it's necessarily insufficient in the sense that, you know, if somebody, for example, Professor Danka, throws me a bunch of numbers, there are, say, two n of them, and all positive, in order for them to be manufacturable by folding a sheet of paper, those two conditions are necessarily insufficient. That is, they have to add up to 360 degrees, or 2 pi, and also, probably he's not going to give them to me in the correct order, but there exists some kind of rearrangement or permutation of those numbers so that in some good permutation, this alternate sum becomes zero, then I can realize those numbers as angles of the sectors I created by squashing a sheet of paper, and the proof is exactly the same as before. I take the largest of those numbers, and then I just fold that sector, and then start folding back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And when I run out of the supply of angles, I know because thanks to this uh, the closure condition that I also close exactly and then squeeze and then open. And you see all those lines coming out, and that's the proof. Okay. Now, let's go into real physics. Do you recognize this man? He looks rather happier than the previous two. Yes, and he's actually a very important figure when you study science and technology in, um, at the university level, and he's Simon Denis Poisson. You know, you run into him all over the place, Poisson's equation in potential theory, and Poisson process in probability, Poisson bracket in analytical dynamics, Poisson this and Poisson that, and Poisson summation formula in number theory and so on. And this Poisson contributed also to elasticity. This is a great chapter in theoretical physics and also engineering, and I'd like to today um, remind you or teach you half of the theory of elasticity in 40 seconds. So here we go. Imagine that you have a block of material and you squeeze it in one direction. Mm, well, what do you think happens? This material, block of material, will probably expand in perpendicular directions, yeah, in response. How much it bulges out per how much you squeeze in, more rigorously you have to take the derivative, is called a Poisson ratio. Or alternatively, you can try to pull this, stretch this material, and then, of course, in response, you expect the material to become narrower, tucking its girth, and how much it got narrower per how much you pull out is that ratio, is the dimensionless ratio, is the Poisson ratio. Is that okay? So this is how you respond in the transverse or perpendicular direction when you sort of deform an object in one direction. Okay. Now, in the literature, the Poisson ratio, notation, symbol for Poisson ratio, is a mess. Some people write it as sigma, some people write it as lambda, which is a disaster because it should denote lambda constants and so on. Some people who should know better write it as P, and so on and so on. There's a huge confusion. Now, after many, many years of deep um, philosophical thinking, I came up with the, finally the correct and God-given, or rather Tadashi-given, notation for Poisson ratio, and it is this. So it should be alpha with a dot. Okay. Now, in 200 years' time, I would like the history of science to remember me as the person who finally introduced the correct notation for Poisson ratio. And let's train our intuition by looking at some examples. Here is what you might call a unit cell, a basic building block. Those black dots are supposed to be universal joints, or hinges around which things can rotate. And those greenish, bluish things are the rods, rigid rods, yeah, if you like bars, which don't bend at all. And if you have a gadget like this, you can readily imagine that by squeezing it along the blue arrows, it's going to respond by expanding along the red arrows. And that's a Poisson behavior. And if you assemble them into a structure, you can have something like an unmeshed um, uh, clothing pattern, which you can use to make a dress. You know, this dress has a property that if you stretch it in one direction, it becomes, uh, it hugs your body much more tightly and so forth. And you can do this with um, other basic patterns like Unix cells. You can do it with a uh, hexagonal pattern and then you assemble them into a beehive pattern. And if you stretch and it will shrink in the transverse direction and so forth. To be honest, Poisson ratio varies a lot from material to material, from structure to structure. But there's something, seems to be something common to all of them, and traditionally it was believed that Poisson ratio should always be positive. 
Namely, it's kind of absurd to imagine something which, upon being squeezed, also shrinks in the other direction, yeah? or being pulled, expand, starts expanding in the other direction. And thermodynamically, there's a problem in instability as well. Mind you, there are actually objects in the world whose Poisson ratio looks pretty much zero. For example, take a spring. I'm not sure that this is the best example, but anyway, take a spring, and if you compress a spring, it doesn't look like it's getting any fatter in the transverse direction. Right? But if you look really carefully and do a rigorous measurement, it is actually becoming a little fatter. So that the Poisson ratio is practically zero, but really rigorously, it's positive nonetheless. Okay. This statement, this belief that the Poisson ratio in nature should be positive all over the place is reflected by the best of authorities. Landau, a Russian physicist, together with his student Lifshitz, wrote the greatest sort of Bible of theoretical physics. If you walk into any practicing theoretical physic physicist's office in the world, you'll see many volumes of Landau Lifshitz's course of theoretical physics. It's really a fantastic thing. I use these volumes more than anything else in my professional life. Here's a cartoon of Landau uh, preaching to his students, and you see also those students have you know, donkey ears and so on, that was because that was said. And volume seven of this course of theoretical physics is devoted to the theory of elasticity. I'm sorry, why? I don't know why this is in French, but that was a copy I had on my, own, my, own, in my desktop. So um, it's, it has a chapter on Poisson ratio, and discussing Poisson ratio, and a footnote. I'm going to translate this in real time. It says, actually, the Poisson ratio varies only between zero and one half, positive one half. We don't know of any body in nature for which sigma, that's Landau Lipschitz notation for Poisson ratio, but do you know a good notation for Poisson ratio? Thank you very much, it's alpha with a dot, right? Okay, well, Poisson ratio should be negative, that is, which would bulge out while being stretched. So even Landau, the greatest authority in theoretical physics, says that that's what should happen in nature in practice. Faced with a situation like this, it's very natural to try to construct examples with negative Poisson ratio. <laughs> and once you believe in the possibility, it's actually not too difficult. Here is a hexagon, six gone, but unlike the usual hexagon, it's a dented version. It's not convex. And if you look at this carefully, you can imagine that by compressing it along the blue arrows, it will start shrinking along the red arrows as well. Yeah? So that's negative Poisson ratio behavior, and you can assemble them into a structure. There are other ways, other ideas for producing a negative Poisson ratio, or oxetic, as some people like to say, behavior. For example, here I have drawn a picture of lots and lots of squares that are glued together, but they are actually connected in an interesting way. When I start pulling them, I'd like to sort of them to behave like this. You see their hinges like this, and you can see that those squares rotate in alternation left, right, left, right, left, right, like a checkerboard pattern, and together they dance this dance and all open up. And if you pull in one direction, it opens up in all directions. That's negative Poisson ratio as well. You can do the same thing with the triangles. That's a half model picture as well. And there are three dimensional models available of those things. So it's not actually true contrary to what people used to believe, that Poisson ratio should be positive. But for isotropic, that is, the material which doesn't have any direction dependence, you know, this way, this way, this way, this way, all directions look the same. For example, sphere is a good example in isotropic um, space. Isotropic materials, Poisson ratio should be not between zero and one half, but between minus one and one half. And those limits have some physical significance. It's in, important to interpret them more intuitively. So one half is the limit. You can't go beyond one half because it's the limit of incompressibility, not to be confused with the incomprehensibility. And let me explain. Incompressible means that the, your body doesn't want to change its volume. Yeah? So if you have a body which is incompressible, doesn't change its volume, and you squeeze it in one direction, let's say by unit amount, well, there are two remaining directions in three-dimensional space, right? So you can go out half and half in order to compensate for the minus one that came in. That's why you have one half. So naturally, in a higher dimensional space, for example, four dimensional space, if you squeeze by minus one, you have to go, if there are three remaining directions, so you go one third, one third, one third, in order to comp compensate for this. So this one half is really dimension minus two. That's what it is. And so you can't do better than volume preserving, so that's the incompressible limit. The other limit, actually, minus one, is the so-called unshearable limit. To shear is a verb, and I'll explain what shear in motion is. Take a deck of cards, playing cards, you know, and you, with which you play poker and, black, um, and blackjack and so forth, and you put them like this, and you put your palms top and bottom, and by, while keeping them parallel, you just slide them against each other. 
By doing so, this pack of cards, which was maybe initially a square, gets deformed into a parallelogram. That motion is called shearing. And it turns out that for negative Poisson, shearing becomes more and more difficult, and at minus one, it becomes impossible, unshearable. Just like uh, you know, in, analog to incompressible. And here's, you can prove this in uh, complicated mathematics, but here is a pictorial explanation for this. Let's say that you have a square which is in brown, and then you want to shear it into this paragraph which is in green. Okay, so that's a shear. Well, instead of doing that, you can do it in two different, two separate stages. The first stage is to take this square and stretch it along the diagonal, along the red, and then squeeze it along the anti-diagonal, so to speak, along the blue. Yeah, so that makes this shape, which is called a losange or rhombus. And having created this rhombus, you then rotate it by a small angle, stonk, into position here. And you see up to infinitesimal errors, this result is the same as the result of shearing. So shear can be written always as a succession of those things. And this generalizes, maybe you have learned about complex numbers in high school, the statement that complex number can always be written as a product of something positive, which is called the modulus, size of the number, times something that represents a rotation, e to i theta, um, and this is a matrix, a higher dimension analog of this. But anyway, that's the way to write this. Now, in case of negative Poisson ratio, this first step becomes really hard to do, because when you try to stretch it along the right direction, the body automatically tries to stretch in the other anti-diagonal blue direction as well. You can't squeeze it. And at minus one, it becomes completely impossible. That's why it's the unshearable limit. Let's move on to go back to the real world. This man is still alive, thank goodness, and that's Mr. Miura, a great aeronautical engineer. And, you know, works with space technology and also airplane technology and so on. And in the 1970s, I believe, he invented a very beautiful fold, which I show here, called Miura Ori. Ori means fold, you remember? So Miura fold. And this has many interesting consequences. So I'm going to uh, show you an example of Miura fold. You know how annoying it is to fold a road map? Yeah? By the way, I realize you know, you're all young. Maybe you don't know what the map is. You know, there used to be a thing called a map made of paper. You, you know this? And, and instead of you know, swiping on, on an iPhone and so on, there was something made of actual paper which you opened and then you looked at the, where things are geographically and so on. And anyway, so it's OK to open, but folding back is really a problem. Um, when you are driving a car, and for example, you want to go from Lund to Stockholm, and then you try to see which way you should go, and you open the map, and you know, that's okay. But then you, when you try to fold it, it never, never falls back the right way. You know, you start creasing here, and start making holes, and tearing here, and you, you, it drives you crazy, and next thing you know, your car is in a tree because you're no longer driving. And this kind of thing happens because the usual way of folding a map has way too many degrees of freedom. I mean, you can fold back in many, many, many different ways. But here is a way of folding a sheet of paper called Miura Ori. When you want to close it, all you have to do is just press the ends, and it bounces into shape automatically. <laughs> there is only one degree of freedom. There is no, no freedom. Yeah? And you can open it, and so on. And if you look at it, it is negative Poisson, kind of globally, right? Because I compress it in one direction, it starts com contracting all other directions at the same time. So, so the statistically, if you like, or globally, it is negative Poisson behavior. And so this is very useful. And in fact, you can buy uh, maps made of this kind of function fold. And the, what I remarked that there is a very, very small number of degrees of freedom. In fact, here, only one degree of freedom. There's absolutely no sort of room for error, mathematically provable uh, fact is very much connected with negative Poisson ratio, and it's also connected with something called hyperbolicity. Okay. Um, I mentioned that Mr. Miro is an aeronautical engineer. One of the first applications was to the um, solar panel of an artificial satellite. You know, a great challenge, as you know, of an artificial satellite is to load and de deploy a solar panel in order to generate electricity out there from the um, energy of the sun. You have to fold your solar panel in some way into a very small compartment because it goes into a rocket. But once you are in orbit, you want to open it up. 
into as large a span of area as possible in order to receive the sunlight. But what typically happens with the usual folding is that when it starts unfolding in space, it goes and it gets stuck sometimes. Because there are too many degrees of freedom, it doesn't unfold very nicely. There are some errors in joints and so on. And then you have lost billions of dollars. But if you fold it in a Miura Ori, there is, I mean, mathematically, there cannot be any room for error. It just opens up and closes down just with one degree of freedom. All you have to do is pull two separate points apart, and then it just automatically unfolds. So this was mounted, this kind of solar mount was mounted in 1997 on a satellite called Haruka, and it was a very nice thing. So far, we have been um, exploring isotropic materials, and now I'd like to and give you an example of an anisotropic case that is direction-dependent uh, weird behavior, and then we'll go for the final stretch. We started at 10.45, right? Is this cl clock correct? Is, is it now 11.20, 11.25? 11.32, so this clock is late, okay. We'll try to do it. Uh, adjust for that. All right. These two sheets were cut out from, the squares were cut out from a single sheet of paper in my office at Stanford, and I put them together like this, and then I hold them with a paper uh, binder clip, like so, okay? And if I just, you know, hold them like that, those two squares stay together. Yeah, they don't separate. Of course, because they're made of the same material, they actually come from the same sheet of paper, as I said. So under gravity, they sag in the same way. Of course, they stay the, behave the same way, so they stay together. But if I turn them over, they separate. On one side, they stay together. On the other side, they separate. So I can start from the vertical position, if you like. And if I turn them in one direction, tilt them in one direction, they stay together. But if I start tilting them in the other direction, they start separating and so on. So there is a curious asymmetry. Yeah. But that's not the only thing. OK. Let's say this is the separating side, yes? OK. Now, keeping them on the separating side, I'm going to move the clip from this edge to this edge. So I'm now going to hold it on this edge rather than on this edge. This was the separating side, right? But now if I hold them here, they don't separate, they stick together. The other side, which used to be the sticky side, when I turn over now, is the separating side. So they've exchanged their roles. This trick, which is inspired by Mahadevan at Harvard, um, was arrived at because we thought Maybe a sheet of paper is not completely isotropic. It has some asymmetry. And that can be illustrated by the following little toy. You see, this was a toy, but I like toys. So this is a secondary toy, toy of the toy. Um, if you cut out a, um, an accordion shape like this, yes, um, you can bend it very easily in this direction. But in this direction, it becomes suddenly rigid. You can't bend it anymore in this direction. This is the principle of corrugated surface, which is used for roofs and so on. So it's an ancient technology, but nonetheless, it's important that you cannot bend it anymore. So I don't know in what direction maybe microfibers of the paper are running and so as to make it as um, anisotropic, but I don't care really. I cut out two squares, but before assembling them, I rotated one on top of the other by 90 degrees and then held them. So if I hold them in this configuration, they stick together because, you see, this rigid one is underneath, which is holding this soft one above. But when I turn over, because they can separate. <laughs> this is almost certainly what's happening in this case. And what is invisible because it's too small, unless you look under a microscope, becomes visible because I just locked those anisotropies together. And if you feel like locked its anisotropy against itself by rotating by 90 degrees. So that's the beauty of the scheme. Another example of um, anisotropy is this. Before I came to this lecture, I went to, you know, where everyone goes to every once in a while and harvested this. I, and then I noticed that when I try to tear it like this, it tears very, very nicely and straight. Okay. But try to tear it in the other direction, 
I'm trying to go straight, but it's very, very difficult to go straight, actually. I go zigzag, zigzag, and it's, it becomes a mess. Yeah? So a sheet of paper can be torn straight, usually in one direction, very easily, but in the other direction, it becomes very, very messy. And this almost certainly is a manifestation of the anisotropy of the paper. By the way, I couldn't help noticing that, that the city hall of Lund, the you know, toilet paper, tears much more easily in this direction than in this direction. And you can sort of think about this later on. OK. Now, let's sort of conclude with a kind of pure mathematical example, a phenomenon, but which suddenly has a very, very real life consequence as well. And here is a funny um, problem. Suppose that you have a two dimensional sphere, really a spherical shell that you see every day in three dimensional space. Can you put it inside a small ball? Well, the answer is you can, if you just wrinkle it and collapse it into a small space, and you have to, do, um, you know. Uh, crumple it. But can you do it isometrically? Isometrically means that if you draw any sort of a curve, any figure on the, on the sphere, its length does not change when you change the, the shape. Well, you can't because when you crumple, you're going to change the length of various things. Otherwise, you can't put it in a small sphere. And this is sort of um, you know, prohibited by what is called the Gaussian curvature, which is a mathematical quantity which measures how curved a space or surface is. And it turns out that when you, for example, dent the surface like this, the Gaussian curvature changes because along this kind of uh, ridge-like pattern, the Gaussian curvature becomes practically zero, although sphere initially had the Gaussian curvature, which was positive. So Gaussian curvature gets in the way. You can't do it without stretching or shrinking the surface. You can't do it isometrically. You can't put it in a smaller space. However, here's a really strange way to think. Um, it turns out that if you learn about differential calculus, the Gaussian curvature needs two derivatives. So maybe we can do it in a, with a deformation that has only one derivative, which is not so smooth. And then if somebody comes to complain, well, you can't do this deformation because Gaussian curvature prohibits it, well, I say, what Gaussian curvature? You can't cal even calculate it because I don't have two derivatives. This sounds like cheating, but really clever people, um, Nash and Gromov, by the way, this is a beautiful mind, Nash, um, Gromov um, invented a way, theoretically, of doing this a long time ago. But then recently, the French team, Borelli and Thibault and so on, constructed an explicit thing and even 3D printed this uh, corrugated pattern. So here is what is kind of an approximate model of how to do this operation. You kind of have this uh, wavy pattern which spirals around, but the beautiful thing about this deformation is that if you look carefully in a microscopic region, along each corrugation there are sub-corrugations, and you don't, along each sub-corrugation there are sub-sub-corrugations. It's a nested pattern. And when I saw this, I couldn't help thinking, ah, this looks a bit like Miura Ori, so I'd like to show you what I mean by this. And then we'll go for the uh, finish. OK. The Crawford Foundation very kindly lent me a pair of glasses. And what I do is take a sheet of paper and then put two glasses against each other, but leave a little gap in between. Okay. And the glasses should be really straight and cylindrical. Okay. And I wrap the paper around those glasses, okay. like so. And having wrapped them, I twist the glasses against each other, like so. And then I sort of squeeze. And what fold I created is quite interesting. Inside, you see some pattern like this. I don't know if you can see. So there's a, And then, seen from the side, it's quite beautiful. You get something like this. And on the other side, it looks almost artistic. You have a pattern like this, wavy pattern, the, whose entire geometry is determined by what we have just done. In fact, by one dimensional parameter, which is the ratio of the gap between the glasses and the diameter of the glass. And this corrugation, if you like, looks very much like the corrugation of um, Borri and Tiber and so on for that isometric embedding. And for a good reason. You see, those people are really smart, so they thought very hard and came up with this. But I think we could have asked nature to come up with this instead. What we did was to try to get this paper into a smaller region by twisting. Well, nature has to somehow respond and find a way of doing it. And the way she did it is to do this. So this is really the most natural uh, response, if you like, elastically, to put something large into small while keeping everything isometric. OK. Another example, which is also highly anisotropic, is this. And this 
Carpet-like thing was invented by Mr. Momotani, another Japanese engineer, a long time ago, and it's called the Momotani carpet. It's a slightly different um, a variation on this. And I folded this from a large sheet of paper, yes, so, and on a long flight between London and South Africa, where I, do, I go to charitable work every once in a while. It's a long, long flight, but I have spent plenty of time. So as soon as the plane um, took off, I started folding the sheet of paper, and my neighbor looked really nervous about this. And you see there's a coffee stain here, and then I kept folding. Of course, I didn't fold for 12 hours. I maybe folded for maybe one or two hours, taking breaks and so on. Anyway, so it's made from a single sheet of paper, and when I pull the ends, what happens is this. And rather cutely, on the other side, what's happening is dual to, perpendicular to what's happening in front. Yeah? And you might notice that it kind of curves this way. That's the hyperbolicity that I mentioned briefly before. And also, this object made of paper has an unexpected behavior. You know, um, it looks like, it behaves like rubber. Rubber is quite bouncy, but you know, a piece of paper is not at all bouncy when you make something out from a piece of paper. You, know, you, don't have, you don't expect much elasticity, but this has, rather surprisingly, an effective elasticity. Look, when I pull and release, it bounces back. Yeah? It's really bouncy. So this is a way of folding a sheet of paper and creating some material which is like rubber. It's quite interesting, and there are some interesting applications that we might come back to uh, later on. Okay, so let's summarize the Poisson ratio. If you take a typical example of a Miura fold, and let's, in order to simplify the, our exercise, let's say that each facet, each face, is a lozenge. In other words, all the edges have the same length. Yeah? In general, it's not true, but this will simplify the calculation, and it captures all the essence of the problem. So in that assumption, any Miura fold can be characterized by two numbers. One of them characterizes the shape, and the other one characterizes the state, if you like. The shape parameter is this alpha, this angle. So if alpha is close to 90 degrees, each facet is close to a square. And if alpha is close to zero, it's very, very long and thin. Okay? And theta is the dynamic parameter. It's the angle between the two adjacent facets, neighboring facets. So if theta is close to 180 degrees, that means the paper is almost flat. And when theta becomes small, you are collapsing the paper more and more. Okay. So in this state, alpha and theta, you can actually figure out what the Poisson ratio is for this object. And it turns out to be given by this number, this formula. Don't pay too much attention to the details, but you see you have a product of signs, and sign is always less than one, less than or equal to one. So if you take the minus second power, this thing is larger than one. Subtracting that from one, you have something negative. So it's negative Poisson, as we expect, and we saw that it's negative Poisson, right? When you stretch in one direction, it um, stretch the other direction as well. But there's more. You see, by playing with the parameters alpha and theta, you can make this any negative number. If you give me any negative real number, I can realize it as the Poisson ratio of this Miura Ori. So not only is Miura Ori an example of negative Poisson ratio behavior, but it's kind of a universal example. It realizes with a single sheet in different states can realize any Poisson ratio, negative Poisson ratio. But there's even more. We discussed this phenomenon of buckling, you remember? So when I compress a rod, it goes into a large deflection. That's a one-dimensional buckling. What about a two-dimensional buckling? What do we mean? You put a sheet of paper, and then you apply homogeneous and isotropic, if you like, compression at all points. It doesn't have to be isotropic, actually. So you compress. How do you do that? How do you, well, if you sort of start pushing along the edges, it's not really good because there's the boundary effect. So maybe you should moisten the paper, or maybe you should change the temperature. However you do it, you can compress it. And there are experimental studies that show that you know, for small compression, the whole thing shrinks elastically while still staying the plane, so that's fine. But at some critical load, the paper can't take it anymore and buckles out into the third dimension. And the crease pattern that it creates turns out to be a Miura Ori, automatically. Yeah. So Miura Ori is nature's first lowest energy response to being compressed in two-dimensional space. So Miura is not only an example, but it's the simplest and, in fact, the universal model of negative Poisson ratio. But at this stage, I realized something. Again, we have been quite clever and trying to work very hard, right? thinking about this and figuring this out and how about this. But actually, there's a much, much smarter and at the same time stupider way of creating a negative Poisson ratio behavior. You don't have to think. <coughs> you let nature do it. You can cramp a sheet of paper. 
And when I do and start ex pulling it apart, what happens? It starts expanding in all directions. That's negative Poisson. Of course, because I made it that way, I just squeezed it in all directions. And of course, in order to undo it, nat nature has to expand it all. On average, yeah, and globally and statistically, not in detail, but on average, it looks like negative Poisson. So that's quite beautiful. It turns out that just by crumpling a sheet of paper randomly, you create something negative Poisson over a large scale and homogeneous and isotropic. So here is a bold conjecture written even in bold characters. You know, until recently, people used to think, well, Poisson ratio should be always positive. Yeah, negative Poisson ratio doesn't exist, or it's a freakish example. But far from being a freakish example and exceptional, actually, it might be that if you dispassionately look at all structures in the universe, the majority of them with high probability might have negative Poisson ratio. And that's because this object looks really random, doesn't it? It's as random as we can imagine. To be sure, we now know that there are some really subtle geometric theorems that are holding there, you know, this alternate sum being equals zero. But apart from that geometry, geometric condition, this is really random. So uh, such a random object has negative Poisson generically. So maybe the truth is completely the opposite. Maybe negative Poisson ratio is the majority case. I'd like to conclude finally. You know, the, we have the impression um, grown-ups and young adults and children alike, that science happens in a certain very specific context. For example, in laboratories in, you know, and institutes, and where do you get the information and you know, publication nowadays on the internet, the libraries, and maybe you are taught and you, you teach in classrooms, and of course you have to write big research grants and cutting-edge proposals and so on. So these are, if you like, the societal organization of science nowadays in modern society, and of course that's all very, very important. That's the mainstream science, if you like, how the adults organize science, and that's where science is expected to come from. So you might ask me, in the light of what we have been doing, why are we playing with paper? <laughs> yeah? If that's how you expect science to arise. By way of response, reply, I'd like to share with you a little known story from Aristotle, from a book called De Partibus Animalium. In there, Aristotle um, is, Aristoteles, is writing about, telling us a story about Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic philosopher who flourished around um, 600 BC. And he was, um, you know, a philosopher and a great scientist of the time, as, if you like, a star of science in those days, the nowadays equivalent with your Crawford Prize winner. And, you know, very much admired. And young people came to see this great, great master, great scientist, and expecting, of course, you know, an um, old man with a white beard, stroking, and maybe sitting in front of a supercomputer and typing something incomprehensible or lecturing magnificently to an audience of thousands of people or whatever. But when they arrived and tried to see Heraclitus, what they found is completely different from their expectation. And here's Aristotle speaking. In all natural phenomena, there is a something of the marvelous. There is a story that some visitors once wished to meet Heraclitus. And when they entered, they saw him in the kitchen, warming himself at the stove and playing with the children. They hesitated. What is, what is this? This is not the image of a great scientist and active researcher that we had in mind. But Heraclitus said, come in, don't be afraid. There are gods even here. Enai garkai and tautatheus. It has been a great pleasure and privilege to address this uh, esteemed audience. And especially, I'd like to thank the Crawford Foundation, of course, and the Niels Denker, who arranged uh, this, and to whose uh, kind invitation I owe this uh, visit to Lund. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tadashi. And uh, let's ask the audience if there are yes. any questions, I hope. Oh, I really want to test this. This is called a catch box. So whoever wants to ask a question will have to catch this. And you will maybe, since I'm not, uh, not a good thrower, either in softball or with this, you have to help me pass it on. So who is first? Come on, don't be shy. Okay, let's try. 
Oh, it's uh, soft and nice. <laughs> it's, it's not like a football. Yes. Okay, the, from this uh, unshareable condition, you said that uh, the Poisson ratio has to be larger than minus one. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Excellent, yes. And doesn't that contradict this re every negative real number? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so thank you very much for the question. I should have mentioned this in the lecture, and I do appreciate your question. So at the end, I said that, well, Miura Ori is amazing because for any negative number you care to throw at me, I can realize it as the ne Poisson ratio, negative Poisson ratio of this Miura Ori. But earlier, I had a theorem, didn't I, that the Poisson ratio should be larger than negative one. But that theorem was under the assumption of isotropy. That is, that there was no direction dependence. But Miura Ori that we have has a big, big directional dependence. You know, it's folded in a certain pattern. And, and that, in an isotropic case, um, it has to be between minus one and one half in three-dimensional space. But in the anisotropic, that is, the cases that lack isotropy, anything goes. And in fact, you can realize any negative number. Uh, that's because of the isotropy uh, hypothesis that's missing. Thank you. It's a little bit like these nanomaterials that I arranged. So you pass it on to the next guy who wants to ask a question. Is it possible to reach uh, numbers larger than one half if you're not allowed to like break um, so the that, question is, the assumption? Uh, excellent question. The question is at the other end for the um, for an anisotropic case, you know, you no longer apparently have this bound between minus one and one half. What about going beyond one half? Um, a very good question. I have to think about it a little bit. Um, but because that bound is the incompressible bound, and I suspect that it, you can't, because volume preserving really is a much more robust condition than isotropic or anisotropic discussion. So I suspect that you cannot. It, I think one half is hard bound up, upstairs in three dimensional space. Yeah? In d dimensional space, it would be one over d minus two. Yeah, but I have to rethink about this. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, second question then. Does that formula break down with uh, one minus sine yes. alpha with, at some angle? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, what about like, that formula? Uh, Sorry. Uh, does it break down at uh, angle, angles that will cause a negative number? Right. So for this, um, um, may I go back to the to the slide, if possible? Is that uh, somebody sort of ch changed this? Uh, no? OK, thank you very much. Ah, excellent, excellent. So uh, the formula that the gentleman is referring to is this one, yeah, that thing. So alpha is this shape angle, and theta is this uh, dynamic sort of bending angle. And of course, there is a singularity, right, when you start going um, toward. Now, on the other hand, you can so what is the largest of sine? It's basically um, one. So you can, if you want to make it one half, you have to make it, um, this should be a square root of two, right? But you can't really do this because both signs are at most one. So you can't go all that, all that far. So in this particular example, Mura Ori, um, you cannot really go close to, um, to the upper, upper bound, but all negative numbers can be realized. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you can hear, yeah. So regarding the random structure you showed about the paper which generates a negative Poisson ratio, is there any possibility that out of this random structure a more ordered structure may occur and can generate a positive uh, Poisson ratio? So the question is, um, it seems that if you do something quite randomly, for example, that's an example of what I call random, it seems to have 
in the majority of cases, very often, usually, yeah, generically, uh, negative Poisson ratio behavior. Um, but is it possible to sort of invent a large class of materials for which there's a positive response? Is that what the question was? Yes? Um, no, it, it, it was more that, uh, more can that. from a random structure or more ordered structure occur, which and consequently generates a positive Poisson ratio. Oh, I see, sorry. So just as Mura Ori can hit any negative real number as the Poisson ratio, negative Poisson ratio, is there a structure which, you know, some of its states and variations will give you all the positive, possible positive numbers as Poisson ratio? Is that the answer? Is that the question? Yes. Um, excellent question, and I think yes, there is. And, well, one thing you can do is to do a variation on, on we have to go all the way back, those little um, mechano-like uh, like things. If you, oops. Yeah, if you do things like that, now this one, if you have a square first in that state, when you compress by 1%, the response is going to be out by 1%, so it's Poisson ratio 1. Yeah? But if you have, let's say, a very elongated state and compress, the response will be much quicker. And also, if you have a very, very elongated state in this direction and you press, the response will be quite slow. So by taking various states of this simple example, you can realize any positive number as the positive Poisson ratio of this structure in that state. Okay. So this thing is changing its Poisson ratio as it deforms, but at each moment of time, it's going through all the positive, um, possible positive numbers. Yeah. Any other questions? I remember there were some kids' books. When you open them, something came out of the book. Ah, yes. So uh, Professor Denka is mentioning the pop-up books, yeah, when you do it. That, that's, uh. Uh, about, uh, about folding and uh, uh, tying the knots, uh, yes. does, uh, does n change by 2 for each knot? That's right. Ah, yes. That's right. So when you make the simplest knot, so one pass knot, and you flatten it and squeeze it and tighten it, you get um, n equal 5 already. And when you make two passes, then n is 7. Three passes, 9. So each time you make an extra pass, you go up by 2. In other words, you're hitting all the odd numbers. And then you ask, well, what about even numbers? Well, even number is always double an odd number. So you can always sort of take the odd polygon and then divide each angle by 2 and then that gives you the irregular polygon construction. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> that could be used when you tie a tie, too, I suppose. Indeed, one. yeah. yeah. Um, you said that a number can be doubled to create an, e to create an even number. But how would you create it for? for ah, excellent question. So how do you create uh, um, four? Can you fold? Well, you do it because four is double two, and <laughs> well, regular two gone doesn't exist so easily. But um, square is easy to fold from origami, so that's a separate construction. I was hoping that somebody would spot that exception, and I'm glad you did. You see, when I can't answer a question properly, I should flatter the questioner, and it's, uh, <laughs> it is an excellent uh, remark. But you can, of course, create a square very easily by folding a paper, so that, that works with. Um. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So how do you fold a um, mirror, or Yes. How do you... How do you fold Miura yeah, ah, So the question is, now we want to make Miura ourselves, how do you fold it? The answer is called Google. And <laughs> no, but the, okay, so let me make a little remark about this. 
the Miura Ori, this one, if you type in Miura Ori, you'll see lots and lots of nice pictures and also um, good directions as to how to fold them. Yeah? So it will be fairly easy, and it's not too difficult to learn. What is much harder, uh, I don't have this uh, on, on this, is this object. That's a momentary carpet. Now, for some reason, um, even if you Google, Google, I mean, there are some photographs, and there are many, many variations of this momentary carpet, some of them really fascinating to invent. But there isn't really any site which gives you directions. I mean, the, not the good one. So I think some friends and I should really draft a, a website for showing how to make this. We all learn how to make this by word of mouth. So you know, I learned it for a little unit, and then you just repeat it, and so on. And then you can start making variations. The basic idea is not too difficult. And in fact, it's quite simple, but there doesn't seem to be a very Googleable um, source of information for Montana carpet. But Miraori, yes, all over the place. Anybody else want to try your luck catching the box? Uh, many people say that there are 10 to the 500 universities, uh -huh. right? I mean, and you're at Stanford, and some of these criminal people are there, actually, you know, proposing these ideas. Mm -hmm. Have any of these models here been used in cosmology? Um, so the question is, um, there's this uh, discussion related to the cosmology, and um, not really concretely, but in, indeed the lady is absolutely right that um, you have a, an excellent nose, if I may say so. Um, some of us speculated about this, because uh, in cosmology, um, you always talk about whether the whole space is curved positively, negatively, or not curved, and this is a famous sort of controversy about the lambda term in Einstein's equation and so on, and different so-called Friedman models of cosmology, whether in the absence of matter, the sort of empty space should have intrinsic curvature or not. And as I mentioned very, very briefly, this kind of negative Poisson ratio behavior is very much goes with the small number of degrees of freedom and also negative, negatively curved, I mean hyperbolically curved behavior. So when I take this momentary carpet and stretch, um, you can come in front later and see it. One, in one direction, the sheet seems to curve this way, but in the other direction, it seems to curve this way, in opposite directions, and that's called negatively curved or hyperbolic behavior. And it might be that there might be a model of the universe to which this kind of discussion might be relevant, especially since the, the universe is known to expand. The only problem with this kind of speculation is that, as I mentioned in the very beginning, you know, dimension 2.5, all of this discussion sort of intermingles the intrinsic properties of the object and the extrinsic property of the ambient space. So it's the interplay between inside and outside. So in other words, you have to have an outside. You have to have, for example, in the simplest case of, uh, of negative Poisson, uh, in this case, you see, it has to escape into some empty space. In this, in the, yeah? Those are called the re-entrant corners. But in the universe, everything is inside. So unless you are kind of starting to do cosmology, excuse me, um, you know, where our universe is part of something larger outside, even sort of fictitious thing, inside which you can talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic, this doesn't really work very nicely from a mathematical point of view. So that's, that's an issue. But, but indeed, hyperbolicity might have some interesting connection with the cosmology. Um, the carpet you had, how far apart can you pull it until it doesn't work anymore? And does that depend on the, the type of folds you do? Yes. Uh, the question is, this momentary carpet that I folded, I keep pulling, 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 and then at some point I'm going to shout, stop, 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 you're going to break my carpet, right? And so how far is this? By the way, this happened actually um, in Tel Aviv when I gave a lecture there and some audience came to me and started stretching. No, 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 it took me hours to fold this. Please don't break this. But anyway, um, but it's fairly robust, I have to say. So basically it um, starts yielding when, you know, the... Um, 
I mentioned something like uh, something called buckling. So buck buckling can come from this way. So if I hold the paper like this and I fold it back, now please give me a moment of silence. When I do this, you can hear the noise. You can hear the noise, right? Here. You can hear? This noise means that from some state, paper is going put into another state, put into another state in a very violent fashion. Otherwise, you wouldn't hear the noise. You see a smooth deformation. Now, be silent again. Doesn't give you any noise. But this make, makes noise. So that means that when we start stretching it too far, a fold like this might actually snap into the opposite fold, and then the whole thing breaks. So that's the, that's the limit. So you just keep within the buckling limit, and then you can go back elastically. But beyond the buckling limit, the deformation becomes plastic, and then you can't go back. Um, in the beginning, you had an interesting sweet sequence of numbers. If you can, like, go back. Yes, yes, I will go back. Yes, and uh, you mean you mean this? <laughs> no, no, bit, no, bit forward. Uh, we, it was it was about the folds. A uh, folds. The knots. A uh, knots. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's right. You mean the. Um, you mean that kind of thing? Yeah, and you had like a sequence of numbers, like three, five, seven. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's right. Three, five, seven, nine, all the odd numbers. That's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I noticed that. Um, do Do you have the? They were written. S sorry, what? Oh. What did you say? Sorry. Um, you had the numbers listed. Uh, the listed. I don't. Last. Yeah, yes, yeah, stop. Oh, I, here, 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 sorry, sorry. I, I, I'm seeing Gauss's theorem, so three, five, six. So these are the realizations of those numbers. So when n is zero, two to zero is one, yeah? And two to one is two, plus one is three. And when this small n is one, it's five. When small n is two, is 17 and so on. Yeah, okay. I don't know, I just thought it was quite interesting because um, the root of four yeah. uh, plus one is three. Uh, 4 plus 1 is 5, uh, seven, uh, 4 squared ah, plus 1 uh, is yeah, 17. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And that's because what you are noticing is this term, 2 to 2 to n. Yeah? yeah? So each time you take a higher, higher power of 2, and in fact the exponent is growing exponentially, you get that sequence 2, 4, 16, and 250, and then plus 1, it's always the second, next number. That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And this is quite significant in number theory. It's part of a huge story called cyclotomy, cutting the circle into, dividing the circle. And that's appeared for the first time in Gauss's great treatise of um, Disquisitiones Arithmeticae. Can I kolla så jag inte kastar dem på Um, I want to ask about uh, the deflection of the ruler when you yes. ap apply uh, yeah. force on it. Um, what determines the, the direction of deflection? Because it can either... That's right. Yeah, yeah. Ah, direction of deflection. Okay, so the question is, when you are compressing um, a rod, let's say a really straight rod at both ends, I claim, and it's true, that that's some critical load. Instead of compressing straight, it prefers to go into a large de deflection. Now, in the case of a ruler, it's clear which way to go. It will go this way, or it will go this way, yeah, in this direction, because it's, it's very difficult to deflect in this way because it's much thicker there. By the way, oh, even that is understandable in physics. There is something called a cross-sectional moment of inertia. It's not the same as the usual moment of inertia, which gives you quantitatively how hard it is to deflect in that direction. So this 
part being much thicker than this being thin means that it's likely to go in this direction, but kind of common sense. But if you have a rod, in which direction it will deflect? And even in this case, it will go this way or this way. What's going to determine the direction? Well, indeed, nothing. Well, in other words, it's an accidental feature. It's, if you have a completely symmetric situation, it will keep compressing symmetrically. But that symmetric situation is, as we call it, unstable. So imagine, for example, the parabola, but put upside down like this. And you have a ball sitting at the top of the parabola. If it's really balanced exactly in the middle, it's not going to roll off this way or that way. right? But if, even if there's a tiniest of error, it will start going this way. And then once it starts going this way, it will go down this way, and so on. So there's a, an un instability with respect to perturbation. And the point is, mathematically, you can write something that balances exactly, but in nature, such a thing almost never happens, yeah? unless there is some restraining force from the outside. So because there are always errors, not only me measurement errors, but nature itself is sort of doing things approximately, so you to always break the symmetry one way or the other, and that's what's going to determine the direction, but you can't tell that in advance, usually. Uh, so can I understand this as um, a phenomenon of uh, butterfly? Well, it's a phenomenon of butterfly which was popularized by Lawrence and so on, that's kind of chaos, and so on. It's, it, that story has lots and lots of problems. But it's much, much simpler than, than this. It's something that you feel every day. I mean, you know, will it fall... For example, if I'm making it stand this way, if I make it stand really exactly balanced, right, it might keep standing straight up, right? But usually you can't and you fall in one direction rather than another direction. Which, what determines that direction? It's this small initial error which grows. That's the um, instability. And butterfly and so on, that's the story which uh, so tries to illustrate this. But it's a much, much more complicated, loaded story. Uh, so you said about the critical uh, force. The yeah, critical uh, load, yeah, yes. Yeah. That's but if, uh, that isn't it dependent on uh, how... Um, yeah, that, that, that's it. So the critical load that you can apply, which causes the large <laughs> deflection to happen, by the way, that's called a plastic deformation, uh, depends on, on lots of things. For example, the, how stiff the object is, it turned out not to be, and uh, you know, how elastic the object is. And also the cross-sectional area, that's very important. And also the length of the whole thing. Long things tend to deflect much more easily than short things. Yeah. And so it, you can calculate this ex explicitly. How accurate, um, how symmetric the force you apply to? Uh, that's right. So the, again, the question is: Well, how how much control can you exert on the symmetry of the force? Well, you can try to do it as symmetric, symmetric as you can, you you want. But the instability is something really powerful. So any kind of um, sort of human effort will be thwarted by this instability, and it's, basically, it's not going to work. Yeah. So uh, the discussion that if you do it, everything symmetrically, it will just compress being straight without uh, buckling is a very, very theoretical and, and kind of science fiction kind of scenario. It simply doesn't work because instability is such a basic part of our nature. Yeah. Anybody on the balcony who would want to try? We have to s <laughs> then we have to throw it upwards. Can't we multiply with an arbitrary power of 2 uh, in that formula? Can you repeat this, please? Can we multiply with an arbitrary power of 2 in that formula? Because so 2 to 2 to n is a very special power of 2. Yeah. Can you do it, for example, 2 to 3, which is not, you know, is that your question? No, I mean the 2 in front of the Mersenne prime. Ah, yeah, yeah that's, sorry, power. sorry. In front of that uh, Fermat prime, um, an arbitrary power 2 is okay because what I mean is once you have constructed the regular um, n gon with that prime, you can always double it, right? Because each angle can be divided in 2 by folding, and that just doubles it. So you can make it 2 times, 4 times, 8 times, any power 2 comes for free. That's right. Regarding the Poisson, sorry if I Poisson, yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm, Poisson. Poisson. Well, 
Yes? Yes, uh, regarding that uh, ratio, uh, does, does this uh, work the exact same uh, way for uh, circles? I wonder, because you have examples of structures right there. And uh, in circles, the ratio, uh, the, the radius is the same everywhere. Yes. So if we were to put them in the structure, no matter how we twist and turn the circle, it will always look the same. So you are imagining, so the question is, what if you make a structure by combining circles, mm -hmm. putting circles together, but you are imagining that each circle is absolutely rigid and non-deformable. Is that what you're imagining? Uh, perfect circles. Like yeah, no, perfect circles, but it cannot be deformed because, you know, if you make a circle made of iron, you might think, oh, it's a perfect circle. It's an, but actually, if you apply a large enough force, it will start deforming, right? From being a perfect circle to something like an oval and so on. But you're imagining that every circle is absolutely rigid. Okay. Then you can make all sorts of um, structures. But indeed, that kind of thing will have um, a much higher rigidity, I think. Because I mean, the, this is very deformable because I put universal joints or hinges around which you can bend without any friction and things like this. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, you can also be a bit more realistic because you know, real material does always have some resistance to being bent. So you can put springs there, if you like, which makes some resistance to, to those rotations. And that would be a much finer, if a little less clean model of this kind of discussion. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone? There's one. One stop. Pass. How is the bulge and squeeze measured? Excuse me? How is the bulge and squeeze, squeeze measured? Is it like a length or is it like a percentage of the original length? I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm jet lagged, so I can't quite <laughs> hear the beginning of the question. How the bulge and squeeze, how is it measured? How is the. How is the bulge, the bulge, uh, how is the bulge measured? Oh, how yeah. is the bulge measured? Okay, yeah. sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. So bulge is you just um, measure by how many millimeters it went out. Okay, so it's just... And like squeeze is also by how many millimeters went in. Yeah? yeah okay. So the, you are dividing a length by length, so it's dimensionless. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So for most of these discussions in elasticity and so on, you should be really working with dimensionless numbers or you should somehow do the dimension analysis first and in order to get rid of the units. Otherwise, you don't have intrinsic meaning. That's it. So a last question? Or are you all feel satisfied? Know everything you need to know? You're filled, so, so to say. Okay, if nobody else wants, let's just thank the speaker again. Now I will ask the chair of the Crawford Foundation, Eva Fischer, to step up and present the diploma to the lecture. Oh, could you please stay, Professor, up, up here? I would like to say a word, some words to you. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I, I only want know one word in Japanese. And I think it's the right word to use now, and that is arigato. Uh, thank you very much. It has been a very uh, interesting lecture and very inspiring. And what a dream to have a teacher in mathematics like this, isn't it? Uh, I would like to give you first your diploma from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and and the Crawford Foundation. It's beautiful, isn't it? So, this is... No, don't fold it. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And 
As uh, Nils told us before, uh, the Crawford Foundation also works with other projects, uh, both uh, 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 with the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, of course, but also here in Lund. And uh, one uh, project that we supported uh, was um, about a uh, mummy from the 17th century. And uh, Professor, uh, it was a uh, bishop, uh, Winstrup. And this is a book about the, uh, this, uh, what do you call, mm. exhibition, of course. And if you haven't seen it, it's on uh, the Museum of History here in Lund, and I think it's actually rather interesting. And I also want to thank Neil Stenker and the Royal, Royal Swedish Academy of arranging this day. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Yes. Thank you all of you who have come here and for your interesting uh, questions. And I hope uh, this lecture inspired you too. Um, and I wish you all the best luck, especially this afternoon for those of you who, who are going to have this uh, Nationella, aren't you? Nationella proof this afternoon, some of you, I think. But thank you for coming and uh, see you next year, some of you. Bye.